Thank you all for coming. I appreciate it. It's an honor for me to be here in Russia. <laughs> so today, I am going to talk about data binding. And we are going to do it all in Kotlin, because it's my new favorite language. Uh, my name is Lisa Ray, and I'm a Google developer expert on Android. And I currently live in Seattle. I've just moved from New York. And I also no longer work at the New York Times, if you saw that on the program. I currently work at a startup in San Francisco. So in this talk, we're going to talk about the data binding framework on Android. Um, this talk is for people who are currently Android developers. You don't have to know anything about data binding, um, but you should have a general knowledge of Android. So if you're looking for an introductory talk, I will not be mad if you leave. So um, I'm talking about two different frameworks today, data binding and Kotlin, but they both have the same goal. It's not their only goal, but they share this goal, which is to eliminate boilerplate code in your Android app and to have fewer bugs. And what kind of bugs from fewer visual errors from getting updates and mixing your data streams and fewer null pointer exceptions. So I firmly believe that the less code that you have to write, to read, and maintain is better code. So that is my goal in this talk. Uh, this talk is going to be a bit of an exploration. We don't have time to do a full intro to Kotlin or explain all of the features of data binding. So I'm going to assume you have seen or written some kind of Kotlin before. Maybe you have seen Kotlin 101. Um, you don't need to have used data binding before. So if you have, say, for the Kotlin, uh, there are going to be three parts here. The first is an overview of all of the best parts of data binding, as according to me. <laughs> um, some Kotlin tips and tricks that are especially pertaining to data binding. And finally, some high-level advice on how to use the data binding framework. Um, I'm very sorry that I cannot speak Russian, but this talk will be mostly code. So if I talk too fast, please read my slides. <laughs> So first of all, what is data binding, and why would we want to use it? It is an Android framework that's helping you write declarative, functional UI code. For starters, what it does is it generates code from Android's XML layouts. And it's generating this glue layer, replacing all of the boilerplate of connecting together your views and your data. And it's generating Java code. But because Java and Kotlin have such good interoperability already, you can use it easily with Kotlin today. So data binding works very well with other frameworks. I often get asked, does it work with Dagger 2? Does it work with RxJava? Obviously, it works with Kotlin. Otherwise, this would be a short talk. Uh, it works with architecture components. You can even use it with other um, view stub generators like Butterknife or Kotlin Android extensions. It does not work with frameworks which replace the Android XML layout, like Enco or Litho. Uh, it also does not work if you write all of your views purely in Java code. And if you do that, just don't tell me about it. So first, I'm going to give you an example of what this framework does. And then we'll talk about where in your app it might be a better solution than the one you're using today. And finally, we'll explore some advanced tricks uh, and interoperability with other frameworks. So for starters, the very first thing to do to get data binding working in your project is in your build.gradle, just add data binding enabled equal true. And next, if you're using Kotlin, and I hope you are, uh, instead of, uh, you need to obviously apply the KABT plugin, and then you need to make sure to add the data binding compiler with KABT. If you do not, you will get very weird errors and nothing will work. You must do this. All right, so we've gotten started. We're going to look at an example of a very, very simple layout with data binding. So I like dogs, so we're going to look at an example of a dog. We're showing it on the screen. And normally, to get this 
this view working, you will need three find view for by ID calls, one for each of the text views, and one for the image view. And finally, you will need three setter calls, plus whatever image library you're using to download this image. So that's six calls just to get the most basic view on the screen. All right. So this would be an example of the classic model. I should have put data class here, um, but you get the idea. So this is a class in Kotlin, very, very simple, ex uh, which we are going to bind to our view. And here is our layout. So in this screen, I've removed all of the layout attributes so we can see what's actually important. So we have a normal Android activity layout where the root is a constraint layout. The first thing to notice is that we've wrapped the layout in a, sorry, we've wrapped the layout in a tag called layout. This one is not a normal part of an XML layout. So this is what signals to the data binding processor we want to generate code from this layout. In this way, it doesn't have to generate code for every layout in your project, just the ones that you specify. In addition to the XML for our views, we've specified by adding a data block that this activity will be showing data of type dog, our model that we just made. And the second thing is this data binding expression directly in the XML. It's an at sign with curly brackets. And the last thing to notice is that there's no view ID, because in this case, we don't need it. We're actually done writing code. This is all the code we need. So in our activity, we see here, instead of the normal set content view call, we're using data binding util dot set content view. And we're passing, it, um, we're passing it our layout, and it gives us back a binding, which is a completely generated class related to our layout. Um, this here is the generated class. It makes these names automatically. It's generated in Pascal case, which is just a name for a capitalized camel case. Um, and this class has a binding.setDog method. In Kotlin, we can use the property access syntax. Uh, so it's binding.dog equals my dog. And now we're done. This view is going to show up. It's going to be populated. And we're good. So what don't you see here? There's no find view by ID. There's no setting properties on our views, and there's no getting them from the model. All of the boilerplate legwork is done for us. So that's the beginning of the magic of data binding. If we do want IDs, of course, if we need to do some setup in our code, you can put them in, and you can have them as normal. But instead of doing find view by ID, um, data binding is here for you in a very performant way. So at compile time, it's going to go through this layout. Um, sorry, at compile time, it generates references to these. And then at runtime, it does one pass through the layout instead of multiple passes through the hierarchy with each find view by ID call. And in the binding, you get a public final field referring to this, um, this view. And these IDs are generated in camel case, no matter if you have underscores in your XML. So let's start having some fun with Kotlin particularly. We probably want to keep a reference to this binding because it holds all the references to our views. So we can declare it as a var. But Kotlin doesn't have nullable types, and we need to initialize it to something. So it's going to look like this. Sorry? Um, so we could explicitly declare this variable nullable until we set it. But then every time we access it, we'll need to use a safe call, and this is not ideal. So we could make it a late init var. Now we don't have to initialize it until we set it in some method, hopefully at the beginning of our code. So this is what late init is far, uh, for, and we're using it in onCreate, which is so far, so good. But it's still mutable. And Kotlin really encourages immutability. So you should use eval if you can. So we can go even further and use lazy. Kotlin's property delegation lets me say that I'm delegating the setting and getting of this property to another class. And in this case, that's the lazy delegate. 
What it does is wait until the first time that it's called here in OnCreate. It executes this code once, and it saves the value for uh, later times that it's accessed. So it's exactly what we were doing ourselves with var, but now it's actually immutable. So it's the best of all worlds. But we can do even better. This data binding util set content view blah, blah, blah is uh, still a lot of boilerplate, and we don't want to do this in every activity. So what if we write our own delegate? So here is a first pass at what our own delegate could look like. Uh, if you haven't made a delegate before, it's actually just a class. Uh, there is a convenience interface you can implement it, but it doesn't have to. It just needs a get value method with these parameters. Uh, so in this case, we have a reference to the enclosing class, the activity, uh, and to the property. It is going to be evaluated every time that we try and get the property, which is w exactly what we don't want. So let's make our own lazy delegate. Um, the default lazy delegate, by the way, is actually thread safe. Uh, this one will not be, but it's OK for us because we are accessing it on the main thread. So here, this one is only going to be evaluated once if value is null. After that, we'll just return it. So we're getting exactly what we want without having to do this in every activity. And to seal the deal, finally, we can wrap our class initializer in a function so it looks just like lazy. All right. So going back to our previous layout, if you want, you can put as many variables as you like in there if you need multiple ones to create your activity. And I'm using property access syntax here, uh, but what will be generated in our binding is a getter and setter for each of these, no matter how many. Of course, if you are using multiple variables, when you set them on the binding, you might want to use Kotlin's apply. Make it clear what you're doing here. And the property reference, the expression language in data binding is not Kotlin, uh, but some things are very similar. So it uses property references. So even if the original class is in Java and it is using Java bean syntax like set property, get property, set text, get text, um, get owner, get name. It's going to, you're going to be able to write your expressions using property access syntax directly in your XML. And along with this, this expression language actually has null safety, similar to Kotlin, but quite different. Uh, it's not like a Kotlin safe call. So you might think that the expression dog.name would do something like this, where it's only going to set the text views text if dog and name are not null. Instead, what happens is something a bit more like this. Um, there is a default value for each type of, um, each type of object. Uh, for example, a string is an empty string, um, sorry, is null, and an integer is zero. So you can get some really unexpected results depending on nullability. For example, if you're setting a view property, uh, zero, I believe, is view.gone. <laughs> so you may not expect this. So just to be careful. Uh, you can also make new XML attributes in data binding. And there are three ways you can have this. The first one is automatic setters. The next one is renamed setters, which are provided by the Android platform. And the last one is custom bindings. So for example, I'm sure we've all encountered an Android class where something is only possible through Java uh, and not through XML. Well, if there is a public setter with the same name as the attribute, then you can just write this attribute in your XML as if the attribute existed. So these are like synthetic setters. An example here is scrim color. Because there is a setter called set scrim color on drawer layout, if you write in your XML, scrim color with a data binding expression. It will just figure out what to do for you. So that's pretty cool. Uh, renamed setters are similar, but um, these have all been done in the Android framework. For example, there's some XML attributes which 
refer to strangely named setters. For example, uh, the tint method, the tint attribute for image view actually refers to set image tint list. So this one would not have worked out of the box, but Android has done it for you, and these are included in uh, the data binding library. And finally, custom binding adapters are really, I think, the best part. I was as excited for these when they were first announced as when I found out about Kotlin extension functions. They're kind of like extension functions for your XML. So you might have noticed this image attribute earlier, which, as we all know, does not exist. Uh, and it loads an image from the network and puts it in your image view. So there are two basic ways that you can get this working in Kotlin. You're going to write a custom binding adapter. And the easiest way, and the one I usually use, you put it at the top level in any file, and then they'll be available anywhere in that package. Uh, you're going to annotate it with binding adapter, and you'll call it whatever you want your XML attribute to be. Inside your, um, your function, you'll take in the, the Android view you're acting on and what you want passed for the value. And that's it. So you can write this code once and never again in the rest of your entire app. So if the logic is specific to a particular screen, one part of your app only, or you just feel better putting them inside a companion object uh, because you're used to Java statics, then that's OK. You just still need to remember the binding adapter annotation. And you also need to specify that you want this method to be generated as JVM static. When I was beginning, this was not obvious to me. And at first, my binding adapter did not work. So that is important. You can also use resources in expressions in your XML. This is something that I wondered why it was missing in the beginning. So now you can do this kind of thing. You can switch different resources depending on values in your model. You can format strings. You can format plurals, all kinds of stuff. You just have to make sure to add the data binding uh, symbol here, because otherwise it will not be processed in the generation, and you will get an error. And there is also a quite complicated expression language, which you can use in your XML. So you can write all kinds of crazy expressions directly in your XML in a data binding expression. Um, but I would recommend that you don't do this at all. The way that you can write logic in your XML freaks a lot of people out. It's the main reason why some people refuse to use data binding, because they don't like it. And I think that's a valid fear. I don't think it's good. And I kind of wish that they had not made this possible. So I recommend you don't do this. And I actually wish they would take it a bit out of the documents. Um, what I recommend instead of putting logic in your XML is to put all of your logic in a view model. So I don't care if you're using as an overall structure MVVM or if you're using something else, but I recommend for your views that use data binding to make a view model because this is testable. Code in your XML is not testable. And as a bonus, by writing in your view model instead of the data binding expression, you get to write Kotlin, which is better. So. so the real power of data binding, apart from getting rid of this boilerplate, is when your models are observable. And I think this is the real power. So you can use any plain old data class that you have already for data binding, but modifying it isn't going to update the UI. You would still have to do this yourself by rebinding. So there are three different ways that you can get updates from your model. Uh, the first is observable objects. There are observable fields, and there are observable collections. Um, I don't really like and don't use collections, uh, but the rest can be useful. So when one of these observable objects is bound to your UI and a property changes, the UI is going to get updated automatically. So in this example, we're going to consider a screen where the user is entering information about a dog. <laughs> and forgive my UI. I'm not a designer. Uh, but they're, they're entering information. They have control over the values of these text fields. When both of them have text, we want to enable a Submit button. Otherwise, no Submit button. So for the sake of completeness, um, these are observable fields. 
I don't personally use these very often, but they can be a good way to help convert an existing model or one that doesn't have a lot of fields. Um, so you use them like this. You use them by substituting an observable field for a string or an int in directly in your view model. And you access them via these setters and getters. And then when you do that, the part of your UI which depends on this value is automatically updated. So as you can see, it's not quite as nice as normal Kotlin syntax, but it works. Um, what I prefer to use is observable models. Generally, I extend a class called base observable, which implements the observable interface. There's just a little bit of code in there to automatically notify your fields when you change them. So the problem here is that in Kotlin, uh, this is not always great, but we'll work through it. What's important to know in your, in your model, you need to annotate your getter, the getter of your, um, your property, not the property itself, with bindable. This indicates to data binding that it should be generating a field in the BR registry, which is sim it's similar to R, but this one is for um, binding values. So to notify that the property has changed, and we need to do this ourselves, it looks pretty ugly in Kotlin. This is a custom setter. Um, first, we have to handle setting the value, and then you call the method on base observable notify property change with your particular BR entry. Um, so we can do better than this. For starters, we can try using a property delegate. So in this case, the delegate is already made for us, which is great. It's the observable delegate, another one built into Kotlin. And it gives us a chance to do something when the property changes. We get this callback. And so we're going to notify that the property has changed. So this is better, but it's still ugly. There's also a shortcut way of writing the annotation. So that's a bit shorter, and it seems nicer to me. Um, but as you may guess, I still don't think this goes far enough. We don't want to be doing this for every property. So we're going to write our own delegate here. And I'm going to call it bindable delegate so that we don't get a namespace collision with bindable annotation. So here we can do dog name by bindable delegate. And this one is um, a bit impenetrable, a bit hard to read compared to the last one, but it's not so bad if you look at it. So this delegate is operating on a class that's extending base observable, so any observable view model, and it's dealing with any type of property object. And it's requiring an initial value of the property type and also the binding entry. And for value, it just returns its internal value. And whenever it sets that value, it automatically calls notify property change. We can also wrap this on our own function to do the initialization. So much like lazy or our set content view example, we can just say by bindable. And if we want to get really fancy, um, we could also make specific ones for types of properties which have um, default initial values so that we don't have to be writing empty string everywhere that we want to do this. So now that we've gotten our bound observable properties looking as good as they can, I want to mention one more thing that observable models can do that's really nice. So suppose I want a submit button enabled or disabled depending on whether the, dog, um, the dog's name is, is filled out, whether the user has filled out the field. So I can do that with dependent properties. And here I'm, I'm indicating that submit enabled depends on dog name. So every time the user changes dog name, submit enabled is going to be reevaluated and changed if it needs to without any work from me. So this is very, very, very useful in complicated forms and places where you need user input and they depend on each other. But you might have been thinking, why is the dog name 
changing at all. Why isn't it always an empty string? Because we never connected the user's input to any kind of listener. Um, I never set a text watcher or anything on that edit text. So this is my favorite and easiest part of data binding, uh, which is two-way binding. So we'll take this edit text in, in a form. In this case, we're not pre-populating the value of the dog's name. View model dot dog name is an empty string because the form wants to be empty when we start. Instead, we'd like our model to be updated when the user changes it. So if you look closely here, you may notice that the data mining expression is different here. It's an at equals and then a bracket. And that's the indicator that Android is going to use two-way binding. That's it. So this says when this field changes, not by me, but by a user or by anything, Android is going to call the setter on dog name on my view model and populate it for me. Um, so if you've ever used a text watcher, you know how simple this is in comparison to trying to get changes from a text view, which looks like this. So I think we can agree that this one is better than this one. I mean, to be fair, you could use a Kotlin delegate to handle these empty methods, but it's still kind of gross. Um, you can also get adapters for two-way binding. You can make them for your own custom attributes. So that is also possible, although I don't think that I have time to cover it in this talk. And finally, there's event listeners, just for the sake of completeness. Um, these might be the most controversial part of data binding. Some people hate them. Some people love them. Um, so the first is listener objects. These can be useful if you're migrating from a legacy structure where you're already creating concrete objects, say, in your activity, and you'd just like to pass the existing ones to your binding. So you would have an object called callbacks, and it would contain these click listeners, or your activity would implement the callback interface. It's OK. I don't really like this one. Uh, you can also have method references. So you could pass a callback interface, which has something called name changed. And it's kind of like um, Java 8 method references, except in your XML. So this is OK. Um, but the tricky part here is getting your method signature to match the signature of the callback that it's, it's implementing. There isn't any auto generation in Android Studio for these, so it can be tricky to get them right. Uh, but these are custom properties that are made for you. Like after text changed, this does not exist in normal XML. So these have been made for you. They've all been implemented by the data binding team. And you can also use, finally, Lambda expressions. So it's like a Lambda, but in your XML. <laughs> and you can pass custom parameters here, like your own user, or any model object that you have. Um, the final thing to note is that you either have to pass all of the parameters that this normally takes or none of them. So if you have multiple, this, this one only has an editable, so you can take it or leave it. But if you have multiple ones, you need all of them or none of them. So if you're going to use these, which one should you use? It depends on what you're doing in your click listener. Um, so it's not just syntax preference. There's actually a difference when method references and lambdas are executed. So a lambda isn't going to be evaluated until the event occurs. And a method reference is evaluated eagerly uh, at binding time. So if you're doing something expensive, you may want to prefer a lambda. Um, but just for your information, if you have been using the standard Android on click, this one actually uses reflection, so you are not getting anything extra by using that one instead of data binding. Data binding is more performant. Um, some people love these event listeners. Other people can't stand to see them. Generally, I actually do not use them. Um, but they are a great way to eliminate that wiring boilerplate of setting click listeners. They can also complicate your architecture if you have to make all these callback classes. So if you are not convinced completely and you're not ready to try data binding, um, you really like to write boilerplate code, I do have a few more examples for you where data binding is particularly helpful. <laughs> 
So partial updates to the UI. In most cases, the most expensive thing you're doing in your app is drawing the view. And in drawing views, the most expensive thing you can do is to invalidate and redraw the whole screen. So in this sense, data binding is as efficient as the best possible handwritten code. It's using bitwise flags to mark the individual fields in your binding as dirty. And then only when necessary, it will rebind just the parts of the UI that are affected by those. So this can be really useful if you have expensive custom drawing. It's also super useful, as I mentioned earlier, for related UI components. It can be really difficult to combine different input streams, for example, a change in this edit text, a change in that dial, a change in this checkbox, and make sure that at every moment your UI is correct if it depends on each other. So if you have a complicated form, if you have ever considered using a state machine to model the state of your view, you should probably consider using data binding, if only for that screen, because it will help tremendously to make sure you don't have an error in the state of your view. Um, it's also very helpful for related components in a recycler view, I've found. So here's an example in an app that I made at my last startup. Uh, it's an app that lets you view song lyrics. And I don't know if this song has made it to Russia, and if so, I'm terribly sorry. But all summer, we had this Justin Bieber song, Despacito, and we could hear nothing else. And everyone is commenting how much they love this song. So you can leave a comment at the bottom of the page about the song. And so here I am. I'm filling out this form. And the submit button is enabled or disabled based on whether I've filled out all the fields. So related fields, this is good. Uh, data binding makes this easy. So you're going to define the state of your submit button as a function of the inputs. And then data binding gets updated at the right time. But the real trick here is that this button is a reusable component that we use in many places. And it's a separate recycler view item. Um, in fact, these, the comment form and the submit button are two different recycler view items. To get this kind of coordination normally, you would need to have both call back through um, click listeners or text watchers, and then dismiss, um, dispatch payload updates, which can be a pain in the butt. In this case, I've just bound each one to the same view model. So when a change happens in one, it happens immediately in the other. And data binding makes sure that you are detaching the bindings at the right time when your items are recycled. So it's one of the easiest ways to get proper updates in a recycler view. Uh, it's also really good for encapsulation of view components as an alternative to custom views. So this is an example of a layout which shows two dogs. Normally, I would make a custom view called dog view, which happens to keep all of the binding, method, um, binding logic, and you can just have a set dog on dog view. Here, all of the binding logic is being generated by data binding. So to avoid repeating myself, all I have to do is include the layout. And I can pass my model object through to the include using a data binding expression. Uh, some other options, Ooh, there's a box. Um, you can have automatic animations when properties change. So suppose you have one of these fancy vector animations whenever a state changes in your button. It switches from submitted or not submitted, or you've joined a group or not joined a group or favorited something. And you want its state to change, and every time you want it animated. You can get a callback by using a binding adapter, uh, either one of the standard Android ones, or I actually recommend making your own so it's very clear that it's being animated, and you won't animate other things by accident. So this is an easy way to get callbacks. Another one, if you don't want an own custom animation, but you just want some animation, the generally right one, uh, then you can actually ask Transition Manager to do it for you. You can add this binding add on rebind callback. So this is not good for very much. It's just a callback, and it just gives you your binding. All it says is that something is changing. We don't know what. <laughs> so it's pretty much only good for this. You're going to tell the transition manager, begin a delayed transition for the view associated with this binding, because something is going to change. And then the transition manager 
will animate any change that happens. Views disappearing, appearing, changing their properties, whatever. So this is a, an interesting way to, to get a bit of animation into your app. And finally, whenever you're doing transitions between screens, uh, when you're doing shared element transitions, you need to set a transition name, which is the same in the beginning and the ending activity. And this can be kind of a pain in things like recycler views, where you're going to need to dynamically change. Uh, like this is a list of many songs. Each one is the same type of item, but they need a different transition name depending on which song they represent. Uh, normally, you'd have to set this in Java when you do your binding of your item. With data binding, you could put it directly in your XML to have the correct transition name. So that's a nice little trick. And finally, as I said earlier, data binding these days does play well with others. The one I get asked the most often is RxJava. Can I use data binding with RxJava? Should I use data binding with RxJava? Um, and the answer is sure. Yeah, actually, personally, I always use RxJava and I use data binding, and I don't find that there's very much overlap at all. Uh, the first and biggest thing is that data bindings observable is very different from an Rx observable. They have the same name, but they have nothing in common almost. A data binding observable is designed to be bound to your UI. It's a connection layer between view model and UI. Um, it's a way of getting callbacks. It's not a stream. So data binding has uh, a mechanism to update parts of your view depending, according to how they depend on each other. And it generates UI code. It, most importantly, it's all synchronous. So what Rx Java is doing, handling asynchronous uh, behavior, is very, very different. Uh, basically, don't try and treat data binding as an event bus for your UI. Do not try and listen to the property change callbacks in your observable and depend on those. If you need updates on the state of your UI, you should be using RxJava instead. Data binding is strictly about UI. Um, I also get asked, can you use it with other view binding frameworks? And you don't need to, because data binding is generating these view references, but you can. So especially if you are already using another view binding framework and you are transitioning to try using data binding, who cares? You have, you have two references to your view. I'm sure you have way worse things in your code base. Butterknife, in particular, is like three classes. So I wouldn't worry about bloat by having both in there during a transition. Um, oh, yes. So data, data binding is like a whole tool drawer or one of these Swiss Army knives. It does many, many things. And leaving one butter knife in your project is not going to weigh it down. There's one note if you're using Kotlin Android extensions. They are very cool. They are very easy. But there is still a big problem where if you are using them outside of activities or fragments, they are not cached. So every time you use one, it's as if it's calling find view by ID every time. They're going to fix it. It's in 1.1.4. Um, in they put in an experimental fix, but it is still not the default. So if you want to use them in this way, you should go look more about it and find how to enable the experimental option. Otherwise, I would prefer data binding. Um, Dagger is another one. Yes, you can use them together. OK, I'm, I'm almost out of time. You can definitely use them together. The biggest problem is that when you have an error, because they're both annotation processors, if you have an error in data binding, it will short circuit all annotation processing. And you will see like 500 dagger errors. And you'll think you're completely screwed. So it's not true. <laughs> it's just that one error in any framework can cause both of them to fail. Um, it's not unique to data binding. This can happen with any other annotation processor, like auto value or any of those. Uh, and finally, it is possible to inject dependencies into your binding adapters uh, using the data binding component interface. And if you, if you want to do this, if you feel inspired to try, uh, a friend of mine, Jacob Tabak, gave a really nice talk called Advanced Data Binding in Practice. And you can also see some examples um, on Google's repo these days. And finally, can you use it with architecture components? Yes. Uh, the only problem is you can't extend both base observable and view model. Uh, 
On the other hand, base observable is like 20 lines of code. That's it. So if you really want a piece by piece observable that's also a view model, you can just copy base observable code into your view model and make a new observable view model. Um, and there's an example, of, a really good example of these being used together architecture components, Dagger 2, and data binding in this GitHub browser sample, which I've found very useful. What's the catch? Why doesn't everyone use data binding? Some people don't like new things. Um, <laughs> Some people don't like new things in their XML. Um, also, there were some problems with errors in the beginning. They were not very clear. Nowadays, the errors from data binding are great. But if you use them with Kotlin, you're going to get all of your errors printed out in the Gradle console. So at first, you'll be like, why did my project fail? Yeah, all your errors in the Gradle console. It can add some complexity to your build process. But Google has fully committed to supporting this as something that can be used in production apps and maintaining it going forward. As far as the future of data binding, um, this was no way a huge overview. There is much more that data binding can do. As far as this future, not only is Google supporting it, but we're going to see changes related to incremental compilation, probably breaking changes. But so if you are afraid of adding it to a multi-module project or of it increasing your build time, in the future, this is shortly going to be an even better option. And I would love to see some of these delegates adopted into the standard library and shipped with data binding. So I hope. Uh, if you have questions about data binding, I will be happy to take them. Do we have time for questions? I, I would be happy to take a couple questions right now. If you found problems in my Kotlin, I will take them later. <laughs> Max, we have about three minutes left. Three minutes, so OK. Somebody has questions. Raise up your hand. Yeah, thank you for our presentation. Uh, my question is about how, uh, which strategy we should use when we want to show kind of dialogue or toast when our data is changed. And we want uh, just not to change one field in XML, but show a dialogue or something like else? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is a good question. I'm, I would consider anything that's other than an update of your existing layout. So something like showing a dialogue is going to involve creating a fragment. And this is outside of the scope of data binding. So if you need to know when your data has changed, I would attach something like uh, an Rx Java Rx binding. Or I would, uh, I would set a normal standard Android listener on this view using the view reference. So yeah, showing, showing a toaster or something like this is a good example of an action you should take, like making a network request or whatever that's outside of the scope of data binding. More questions? Uh, thanks again for the presentation. I'd like to ask, how do you find uh, a balance between lots of binding adapters for custom text and between operating with uh, uh, view itself from Android code? It's, uh, it's a good question. You can end up with a lot of custom adapters. In general, I like to strike a balance. I will write the custom adapter, which depends on my application's logic, and then I'll keep the resources and things like this in the XML. Um, I'm not sure that really answered your question. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess if you're trying to ask how many binding adapters are too many, that's going to depend on your team. I would recommend starting with the standard the standard library and writing just a few essential ones, like loading an image. Well, the problem is I have faced uh, that uh, when I'm trying to bind uh, lists with uh, generic types, I have to write a lot of binding adapters for uh, uh, specific generic types, mm -hmm. like list boolean, list integer, and so on. And uh, it ended in a lot of binding adapter methods and functions. Mm -hmm. And thus, uh, probably uh, Kotlin uh, in uh, generic uh, would help this, but I'm not sure. Have you tried also binding yeah, lists with ingenieurs? Yeah, I'm not sure if you can have a generic binding adapter. I don't think that you can. Um, but this might be the, the, might, the better answer might be to extract these into a library or something so that you can reuse them across your projects and not have them clutter your main project. Thank you very much. Anyway, I think we are out of time, so I'll be happy to continue taking questions or discuss. <laughs>